Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Career Talks. I'm Alejo, and I'm a rising senior at Berkeley High School. This session has been produced by the Experience in Research Interns here at the Berkeley Lab. Today, my project partners, Julian, well, Gregory and Faith, will be taking you through our sessions as we go through. Feel free to add your questions to the chat box at any point. All right, uh, well, for those who are new to this program, this series is being hosted by the K-12 team at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Well, Work Lab is one of the 17 departments of energy national labs across the country. It is also located in Berkeley, California and home to many amazing research facilities. Today, we will be focusing on advancing Berkeley Lab's research through ESNet the lifeline of communication at DOE National Labs. Our four panelists will give a short overview of their work before we get into our discussions. Now, I would like to bring our first panelist, Jesse. Please join us and begin sharing your slides. Awesome, well, hi everybody. Um, very excited to be here. I am newer to ESNet. I just um, am hitting my one year anniversary um, and I'm a network engineering group lead. So I oversee um, a couple subgroups within the department. So I'm just gonna do a sort of rundown uh, about me cause I have a very winding road to get to the lab but I grew up in Seattle um, and I always had a really deep love of all things artistic. So I love performing arts. I love visual arts um, and when I was leaving high school doing my, my college hunt, um, I did a big audition tour uh, for all of the big top uh, conservatories, but I didn't really get into a ton of places that I wanted to go to. Um, and I found that a little discouraging um, because I felt like I had done everything I needed to do to make myself a really appealing candidate. So I had a 4.5 GPA. I was president of my high school. I volunteered for anything and everything. I was performing in my community. Um, but uh, you know, I didn't get into the schools that I was most excited about. Uh, so I guess my first bit of advice is just make sure that you're not measuring your, your accomplishment or your worth um, based on the schools you get into. Cause I ended up going to the University of San Francisco and that was the perfect school for me. Um, but I definitely didn't know that at the time. Um, so something to keep in mind in the future. Um, I loved University of San Francisco. I got a dual degree in performing arts and social justice. Um, and I loved it, but I knew that I wanted to start being paid to act right away. Um, so I took an extra workload and I got done in three years instead of four, so I could just go right into the workforce. And I did a million crazy odd jobs to support myself, mainly in restaurants um, and in agencies like ad agencies and marketing agencies. And I think those are both fantastic places to study people. They help teach you patience and agility. Um, they teach you hustle and they're really creative, um, but they are uh, long stressful days uh, in both of those industries. Um, so I had to make a choice. It was either keep acting and, and directing at the time or um, go into agencies full time. So I decided I wanna keep with theater. I um, moved to New York sort of in about a week and a half, I think. I auditioned for a conservatory and a week and a half later, I came out here and that school was called CAP 21, um, which is an offshoot of NYU that is now associated with the new school. Um, but if I thought anything was challenging or grueling before conservatory, I was dead wrong. That is um, 12 hour days, seven days a week at minimum. Um, and then I was working overnight at restaurants to be able to pay for school. So as much as I loved it, as much as it was really rewarding, um, it was also really challenging. And um, I decided I was ready for a pivot. So um, after a decade in, in side jobs, uh, I decided to, to commit myself full-time to a digital marketing agency. And that's when a company called Pilot Fiber came and found me because they had an engagement opportunity that they thought I might suit. Um, I thought they were crazy because Pilot is an internet service provider based in Manhattan. And I knew nothing about the internet at the time, um, but I took the role because I wanted a new challenge and I wanted to learn. Um, and it ended up being one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, so I loved the engagement role that I did originally, but I was seeing that the network operations team could use some work around communications and sort of improving some of their operations to provide a more a superior 
customer experience. Um, so I convinced my CEO to spend uh, three hours a week with me doing all deep dives into network engineering land so that I'd be able to speak network engi engineer and be able to support that team. Um, so I worked in various pieces of that team and eventually managed sort of all of engineering and operation. Um, and I was at Pilot for six years. And I thought, okay, I know I love technology, um, but I want to round out my skill set. Uh, and I want to actually go to school for this. So I went to NYU and got my master's in science that I just finished uh, in May. And uh, after I graduated, I thought, okay, I love Pilot. I've been here for six years, but it might be time for me to now spread my wings and do something new. So that brought me to ESNet. Um, and just sort of to talk about my role at ESNet or to talk about ESNet, I guess, in general. So modern science is a collaboration and it involves many different groups and it's also very data intensive. So there might be, let's say like a special instrument in the States um, at a laboratory and it requires connectivity to another group of scientists that's working in Europe. Um, and maybe they're tracking special weather conditions and they need to process exabytes worth of data. Um, so our users are essentially looking at a bunch of different information, they're running different experiments, but ESNet is really what connects everything um, and makes it all work by getting the data to the places that it needs to be. So at ESNet, um, I'm managing engineering efforts in two specific groups that I oversee. So that's uh, the site solutions team, and we're responsible for the full life cycle of connections and services for our customers. And then we have a peering group um, that is responsible for essentially the deployment and the management of all of our external connectivity. So that means like cloud connections and internet exchanges. So in wrap up, it's a very exciting place to work. I'm loving it. Um, it. It's great to have a clear mission because previously working in the private sector, everything is sort of about the same focus, which is acquiring more customers, making more money, right? Um, but it's been really a nice breath of fresh air to work in research uh, and education. So um, I love it. I love it so far. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. That was great. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Now I would like to introduce Dan and I would like to welcome him to our virtual stage in order for him to introduce himself. Hi, thank you. Great presentation, Jesse. My name is Dan Doyle and I am a, my formal title is a principal full stack developer, although I just think of myself as a software developer. And like Jesse, I have been here for just about uh, shy of a year although I have been doing this field for quite a, a long time. So when we talk about me, I thought I would talk about my journey so far, basically what is, what is this weird set of steps that led me to where I am right now. So I grew up in Massachusetts, um, actually very close to Boston. Uh, and if you're paying particular attention, you'll notice I don't really have that Boston accent anymore. I haven't lived there in probably 15 or so years. And it was one of the things that was probably the first to go. Um, although if I go back and visit family, it, it tends to come back out. I've always really been into computers, but way back when I was a kid, I never really thought of it as a career. It was just kind of a hobby for me. And this was back in the day, you know, YouTube didn't exist. Google didn't exist. Um, my mom, I was, you know, four years old and my parents would help me connect to BBSs on the internet or, you know, what passed for the internet back then. And it was fascinating to me this idea that you could connect to all of these different places around the world instantaneously well all right it's not nearly as instantaneous back then as it is now but for all intents and purposes instantaneously and we would use it to download little games um you know maybe swap a few messages things like that but back in the day that to me uh, it really opened my mind to the possibilities here um i've always had a really curious mindset uh, is not necessarily just limited to computers, pretty much to everything. Um, maybe the, the best example of this is when when I was probably six or seven, uh, we got a new um, 
uh, washing machine and I begged my parents not to throw away the old one because I wanted to work on taking it apart. I, I, I'm not going to pretend I had any idea really how it worked, but I really wanted to see what it looked like inside, right? How do all of the pieces sort of come together? And, and they humored me on that. We managed to keep it around for a little while, at least until it was, you know, suitably disassembled and, and then it got swept out. Um, I moved to Indiana for college. Um, I have family out here and I really wanted a different change of pace. Uh, I'll fully admit growing up on the East Coast, I had this view in my head that Indiana was going to be nothing but farmers and farmland. Uh, and I'll be honest, that's true for some parts of Indiana. But I live in the in the south uh, towards where it becomes a little bit more Appalachia. And I had no intention to stay here. Um, but life is funny. I ended up meeting my wife. I've met some really good friends. Uh, it's a great area. I live in a college town. So, uh, you know, it's big enough that it attracts a lot of interesting things, but small enough where there's no traffic. There's no light pollution, really. Uh, it's kind of a nice balance for me. And when I went to school, I originally went in, oddly enough, for this thing called classical studies. Uh, that's really ancient Latin, ancient Greece. Um, and I had a minor in CS. I knew I liked computers, right? But I was just going to treat it as a minor. Um, I had toyed with the idea of teaching. Um, I thought that that could be a fun thing here. I've always uh, had... I've always taken a lot of joy in being able to explain something to somebody and see them succeed. It probably factors into why I'm in this field in general. And unfortunately, um, I realized after maybe the first one and a half years that there wasn't a huge future there, to be honest. And so I ended up swapping. I switched CS into my major, and I decided to do all those other things as minors, and I, I did finish those. So as far as how I got to ESNet, uh, right out of school, I was hired to work at a local place called uh, GlobalNOC. It's a network operations center, and it provided support for RNE networks across the world. And how I got this job, honestly, was just being in the right place at the right time. I was at a picnic <laughs> for the School of Computer Sciences, and I bumped into some people. We got to talking. They said, hey, you seem like a sharp guy. If you're interested, why don't you come check this out? One thing led to another, and I ended up working there for about 13 years. <laughs> um, I, I've always worked my entire career as a full stack developer. And what that really means is I implement everything from the bottom. So, you know, like maybe data collectors, databases, all the way up to the front end, um, you know, where people are clicking around on web pages to actually implement things. And I learned a ton from that. And the funny thing about it is that it's a really small world. Um, even at my time working at the Network Operations Center, I actually worked alongside several people at ESNet just on collaborative projects where I would bump into them on conferences. And so instead of being right time, right place, it actually was more a function of networking. Um, I knew these people. Um, eventually, it made sense for me to you know, branch out and uh, you know, get the opportunity to try some new experiences. So far, I think it's working out pretty well. <laughs> and so what I do specifically at ESNet, I am still a full stack developer. Um, I work on the measurement and analysis team. Uh, it's a team of about 12 people. Some people are like half on it, so it depends how you measure it. And I predominantly am responsible for writing and maintaining systems that instrument the network and help visualize it, right? These are complex systems and you sort of need to be able to, to zoom into the right level to maybe solve a problem, to justify an upgrade, something like that. And specifically, uh, my role here, I mostly focus on the back end of these days. The, oh, I'm sorry, mostly focus on the back end these days. Data collectors, back on the databases, API design, uh, that, that sort of thing. So I think I'm just at about time here. So I'll go ahead and pass it over. Well, awesome. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome Katrina next to the stage for her introduction. Hey guys, thanks for the intro. I'm Katrina Turner. I work, my formal working title is a data visualization and UI developer, um, but like Dan, I'm just a software developer. Um, so I'm actually also on the measurement and analysis team at ESNet, and I live in Kaneohe, Hawaii. That's my hometown right there. Uh, so funnily enough, Jesse, I also started as a musical theater girly, and growing up, that was what I did. I did musical theater. I danced hula for a very long time. Um, 
And I kind of thought that's what I wanted to do until I went to college. And I was like, oh, maybe I should, you know, do something that's a little bit easier to make money with. Um, and so I played with a couple different majors, but ended up landing on math and education. So then I became a math teacher for seven years. Um, throughout my time as a teacher, I actually still danced Tula and did musical theater. So that worked out pretty well, um, but for lots of reasons um, that we won't get into, I decided to change what I did as a career. I wanted to kind of settle down, start a family. Um, and so I went back to school and I got my master's degree in computer science and I became a computer science cool kid, as I like to say. Um, next slide. And so I had applied for uh, the math graduate program at University of Hawaii, but I took this random summer class that was coding um, Altino cars. Super, super random. It was put on by like a local company for teachers, and I just took it because I had nothing better to do that week. Um, and I found out that I actually really, really liked coding. Um, it had previously been like furthest from my mind. My dad was actually a software engineer and I thought it was super boring. And so I didn't want to do it at all. Um, but I took this class, thought it was super cool. On a whim, decided to also apply for the computer science program um, and got it. I actually, they called me to accept me first. And so that's where I went, was not super picky. I just knew that I wanted out of teaching and into something else. Um, so I ended up doing graduate school at, again, University of Hawaii at Manoa. While I was there, I worked at this really awesome lab called LAVA, which is the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, um, which is what those two pictures are. They work on a lot of Aside from regular visualization, they do stuff on large display walls and VR, AR, um, and various things like that. Uh, funnily enough, while I was there, I actually worked on a project with ESNet. What do you know? Um, we supplied the visualization element uh, for an NSF grant funded project. Uh, we worked actually with IU and ESNet. Um, so I did that as a research assistant while I was in school. I also had a baby along the way. Um, he spent a lot of time coding with me while I was finishing up school. And then I finally graduated. And in my last semester there, the folks at ESNet were like, hey, what are you doing when you graduate? And I was like, I don't know, I'm trying to find a job. And uh, so they were like, well, you should probably apply to work here because we're hiring someone to do literally exactly what you do right now as a grad student. And so I applied for that and I ended up here. I've been here a little over two years and I love it. I'm so happy that I got to stay in the research field um, and that I got to stay here in Hawaii and have a job that supports me here, which is not always easy to do. Um, and yeah, that's how I got here. Awesome, that was a great introduction. Oh, I forgot what I do now. Not bad. <laughs> Oh, I love it more. No worries. Um, so yeah, my main roles are to visualize network data. Um, we have lots and lots of data that we collect and we need to visualize it in a way that the stakeholders, both external and internal, can understand what's going on in the network to help them make better decisions. So I mainly do front end stuff. I write Grafana plugins and I create dashboards in Grafana to help them with that. I also help with UI design and coding of the UI for other new software projects. And that is the end of mine. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it was a great introduction. I love it. Well, uh, well. with that being said, there's also one more, one more panelist. Ken, please come and join us and introduce yourself. Okay. Uh I can't unlock the video, but that's all right. I'll keep talking. Um, so Ken Miller, I'm a science engagement engineer with um, ESNet. I've uh, been doing this for about three years now. Um, can you advance this? Uh, start my video. Okay. Um, kind of. I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, always kind of tinkering and working on something. I was always m machines and equipment to fix. And then um, my dad was actually a telephone man. I used to work on all the telephone systems years ago. And my mom was a writer. Um, <clears throat> so I've actually been working and tinkering with computers on and off for over 40 years uh, since my dad first got his original kit and started coding um, <clears throat> and early on years ago. Very, very old, slow computers nowadays. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of where I started. And then Kind of worked on that through high school, did, did a lot of work in math, and then um, got into uh, just really where I wanted to go to college. I was always looking at Penn State, and then I went to a financial aid seminar and ended up going to school for engineering. And then once I got into some of the computer and coding classes, I looked to switch to computer engineering and then switched eventually to computer science. Uh, and then while doing all that, I also played soccer and tennis uh, at college. Um, so as I scaled, went through that, um, started my career as a developer, uh, migrating system, uh, systems and databases um, from uh, older systems into you know more <laughs> more modern systems at the time. Um, and then as I get into that, uh, looked into systems administration, uh, kind of all these systems I was migrating. I just started running these systems as well. Uh, switched jobs, became a system administrator, and started running these for a, a reseller network and doing a lot of conversions. The same conversion I did during my, during my first job, a lot of the coding, a lot of system administration, and the jobs following that. Um, and then from there, as the internet, you know, was taking off and um, getting uh, different systems like that out there, computers became a lot more instead of like isolated, they could became networked. A lot of the applications became distributed, decentralized. Uh, the networks really provided every all the connectivity between all the applications and the people and all that. So I uh, started teaching some classes, but then also started working on uh, computer networks, voice and video systems and networks, uh, different things around data, data collection, uh, data sensors that are out there. Um, then as wireless started taking over and then also in security systems. So all that stuff really runs over top of the network. So networks are very, very vital to what we do. So my curiosity kicked in, like Dan mentioned it himself, um, and just kind of curious what's next. So I kind of get into the network engineering role and understanding where things were. Um, and so from there, we got into, we we're always getting calls like everything's slow. Uh, what's wrong that, you know, I can't get to this or so I started investigating network performance and then at the same time um i was working at penn state university um and from there the I, there was a grant that was happening and they're like oh you kind of do this stuff why don't you take this job and so we it was approached about taking the job um got into that started working with researchers more directly about transfer issues some things they're having with um accessing systems collaborating with people around the world started understanding and found out about internet too and also ESnet at the time um, with some of these other collaborations and really just started following what ESnet was deploying and try to do what I could do, what ESnet was doing, what I could do at Penn State's campus for about 10 years there. And then eventually, you know, position to open up and I was, you know, um, asked to apply and here we are. So um, two of the things I work on on the left, um, we build dashboards um, similar to what uh, Dan and Katrina were saying about uh, looking at the network performance. We try to monitor that as, as best as possible, but we also try to take some of the technology out of it and try to make usable um, app applications or references to what's going on. So we built this data transfer scorecard at the bottom left there that really can visualize um, across really any any sort of uh, curriculum you're in in the research world, whether you are a researcher, whether you are a network admin, whether you are a systems admin. They all talk the same thing on data transfer, but they all speak a different language. They all talk about different data rates. So building things like this and make building a common platform across to users is kind of what we look into. So, so ESnet's vision is there at the top, but what we also do is we try to, you know, since the network connects everything, we try to be completely unconstrained. So a lot of what my team does now is gather requirements reviews so that we can hand off um, engineering or individual connectivity options um, back to groups like Jesse's so that we can understand where things are going. So we try to uh, look at the science, understand what's really going on out there, understand some of the coding, some of the applications, some of the systems they connect to, some of the networking connections they need, and kind of really the, the entire ecosystem, how the research and the workflow happens. We try to build it into documents. Um, we do two of those a year, um, and about every three years we we work through each individual office of science that's out there and by doing that we can kind of build some short-term medium-term long-term network requirements or application requirements um, for the multiple groups that might need this information so we try to build 
you know, kind of the framework of really what the next steps are uh, as we work with the researchers and the research teams. So from there, this is kind of the idea of the map, how ESNet connects to everything. Um, and we will really work anywhere across any of these hub sites, any of the universities that are connected through there. And we treat the network just as a critical component of the sciences out there as well. So as we're going out and doing science engagement, we understand there are network components to it. There are research, but there's also collaborators across different universities as well. Sorry. And so the we say ESNet is a data circulatory system of the entire Office of Science. We have a few statements there, but we also manage and maintain a, team, a information we find, any lessons learned we have on here and best practice we publish on a page called fasterdata.es.net. So that's all about how to tune machines, how to understand your data transfers. So any of the things we learn through our engagements through the, whether it's in coding, whether it's in tuning systems, whether it's in uh, the application itself, or whether it's in tuning the network, all that information or lessons learned, we try to publish and provide back out to the community again um, on this page at the bottom there. And then these are two fun things that I've taught a few intro to networking courses in the past. And these are two books I ask people to kind of read through those. The one on the left is kind of really, you know, an interesting take on just an author's view of how we try to understand how the internet and networking works. And then the one on the right is really a networking piece um, that is really understanding the network and how it relates to high frequency trading and things like that. So these are, again, networks are a general concept, but also networks can be very specific to the purpose they're built for. And that's what ESNets built are out. And that's kind of what these two books talk about as well. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all for thanks to all of our panelists for the wonderful introductions. Now I would like to pass it to my co-hosts, Faith and Gregory, to start a moderated panel. Hey, thank you. Thank you everyone for all your introductions. I really enjoyed them. I and mean, I feel like I learned something. Inc. So uh now we can start a moderated panel. No. So my name is Gregory. I'm a student at San Jose State University, and I just graduated high school. And I'm really excited for our discussion today. So I'd really like all our panelists to join us back on our virtual stage and turn on cameras. All right, perfect. So I got a few questions for all of you, and me and Faye will take turns asking questions. So my very first First question, um, just to start things off, off uh, Ken, what is the internet? Uh, <laughs> it's really just a, a connection um, of computers and systems and resources around the world um, that you know can provide multiple services. It's really just you know network connections between everything, different systems like that. So, ah, so it sounds like the internet is just a fancy a way of saying that it's just a bunch of computers connected together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, it can be very, it's very complex, but it, it's a, a rudimentary and you break it down. It's very, very fundamentally, a lot of the same stuff just repeated over and over and over. So a lot of the same things. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ken, for your answer. Will anyone else like to chime in? All right, great. So to move on to our next question. All right. Thanks, Gregory. So everyone, hi, I'm Faith Dukes. I'm director of our K-12 programs here at Berkeley Lab. And thanks to our panelists for joining us today. Um, my next question is for Katrina. So we're building up our, uh, our knowledge base. So going from what is the internet to how does ESNet differ from the general internet? Great question. Um, so the general internet, as Ken said, is kind of worldwide. ESNet is much more specific. So actually, if you look at that awesome map behind Ken's head, um, ESNet specifically <laughs> connects uh, a little over, I think, 50 um, hubs and sites. So it's all the DOE national labs, um, our supercomputing facilities, and some of our major scientific instruments. Um, and so it's closed to there. If you want to collaborate with people outside of that, we also are connected to over 100 other networks. So if you want to send stuff between universities, they can go through our network and then go back out to another university or something like that. Um, another main difference is that we are way faster, like way, way, way faster. 
Um, so for example, at home, you have maybe 100 megabits per second to if you have fiber, you maybe have one gig per second. And that's really great. You're doing really well. Um, and you have pretty high speeds. At ESNet, our links are like 100 gigs or 400 gig links. We just upgraded to ESNet 6. And so our overall bandwidth, I think, is 46 terabits per second. Am I correct on that, Ken? Something like that, uh, maybe a little more. And we transfer about 20 petabytes every month. So way more data than you're used to. To put it into perspective a little bit, if you get a two hour 4K movie on Netflix, it's about 28 gigabytes because they do some compression and stuff like that. So you could do four of those in a second on one of our smaller links. So that is way faster. I mean, that's like ideal speeds, right? No one gets that, but still. Um, so yeah, much bigger or much smaller in terms of who we connect to, but much faster in terms of how much data you can do. Oh, wow. Thank you very much for that answer, Katrina. Uh, um, yeah, it really sounds like uh, ESNet is really a specialized network just for uh, science and because that has to be way faster than and like general internet connections that we get uh, here. So I know they were uh, alluding into this earlier, but I'd like to pass it, it over to Dan again. So it's like, um, why do you feel like a dedicated research network is necessary? Why can't the labs use the internet to share all their data? So as Katrina was saying, um, um, for one thing, ESNet is like way faster than like the general internet, but you have any other reasons why the, um, um, you feel uh, even now today, a, a dedicated research network is necessary when the internet's the thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a bunch of reasons. Katrina definitely highlighted one of them, and I just want to reinforce that point. Um, when we're talking about the sites that get connected here, probably one of the most well-known and prestigious would be the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and if you go take a look at that, the amount of data that it is capable of generating as a result of these experiments is extraordinary. I mean, it's I think it's on the order of petabytes a, a day. <laughs> um, so uh or or maybe it's a month anyway it's a lot of data and in order to be able to move this around the world we really need networks that provide that amount of bandwidth we don't want them competing with cat memes and tiktok videos right but it also has to be instrumented for that right the parameters of the network itself have to be tuned to uh prioritize and benefit larger longer duration flows than these much shorter you know checking your email and such i mean it does all of that as well but the the focus of the network is specifically uh geared towards science um having a dedicated network also allows you to experiment on the network itself right you can try different protocols you can try different ways of slicing and dicing the network and you don't have to worry about uh breaking or upsetting uh you know the internet <laughs> as a global commodity right you're just dealing with a particular piece of it um additionally there's the the cost factor uh Jesse mentioned this earlier in her presentation when you're talking about companies like say Comcast right people are probably familiar with that or, or AT&T they're run for profit um they are predominantly motivated by getting customers and getting dollars <laughs> and what that means is that when we're talking about connecting all of these different labs together you can really drive down the cost when you have a network that is dedicated to serving that um that particular demographic. It's, we're not worried about charging the labs the most that we think we can squeeze out of them. We're mostly focused on providing a high quality service. And the last part um, that I'd talk about is possibly security. Um, there's a movie that just came out earlier this week, uh, Oppenheimer. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's the story of the development of the atomic bomb. And while this story predates the internet, I still think it sets a pretty good backdrop for what I'm describing here. That mo most of that research and testing happened in Los Alamos, which is one of the labs that ESNet connects to. Um, you can imagine that in today's day and age, if there were research of that sort going on right now, having your own separate network or adding those additional layers of partitioning can really be a strong security measure as well. 
Dan, thanks for giving us that full understanding of why we need ESNet and everybody giving us those layers that we needed to understand um, the difference between the internet and ESNet. And this question is for everyone. Um, what is ex something exciting about your role in this project? I'll start back with Jesse and then go to Ken, Katrina, and then Dan. Yeah, well, something exciting for me as, as a new hire, I guess when I was originally hired, um, is that we were right in the middle of a restructure in our department. Um, and that meant that I sort of got to hit the ground running in terms of being able to um, make recommendations and have sort of an impact uh, right away uh, to help improve some operations and some process flows for us. Uh, and often when you're you know, on the other side uh, of the coin in a job, you might just sort of get slotted in and not have a lot of creative license, right? Because maybe everything um, has been in place for a long time and you you get set up for the role um, that you've been hired for and then you go off and running in that direction. But because I came in literally as, as a massive project was dropping up, which is ESNet 6, um, and we were looking at opportunities to sort of improve the way we function as a team, I got to start right in the middle of that. Um, and I saw the timing was really, really awesome for me um, to get to have some creative license sort of right away. I would say for me, I think something exciting working on right now is, um, is this, we talked about, Dan mentioned the, uh, you know, the vision bomb and things like that, that was developed, you know, early days of the Department of Energy and things like that. Um, but at the same time, we're working on new stuff now where the energy we're looking at is, is clean energy. We talk, take the, the fission uh, idea and, and flip it to fusion. We're working on a fusion reactor being built in France right now that could potentially, you know, power so much energy. It's unbelievable. And they're getting to the point now where on one of our projects, the amount of energy to run the machine is almost getting similar to what's coming out of the out of the reaction after the fact. And after a, after a fusion reaction, what's left is helium. So it's an inert gas and we get a lot of energy out of it. So that system's not online yet, but we are in the process of making sure we have connections to this because we do have um, different researchers around the U.S. Um, on the West Coast, East Coast. So I was just at a lab a few weeks ago that has uh, tokamak and fusion reactors that they're understanding this kind of uh, energy uh, science being applied. So we're making sure that ESNet is connected to these sites so that we can collaborate and try to find better uh, energy systems from around the world that don't have detrimental effects to the environment, uh, but are also sustainable as well. So, Okay, that's really cool, Ken. Um, mine is a little simpler than that. Um, I really enjoy that since I do a lot of front end work, I get to really incorporate a lot of my creative side into what I do. Um, and because we're in the research world, um, everyone kind of gets to have input and have their own voice and make suggestions. Uh, we're working on a brand new piece of software or brand new software application um, in our team to support one of the other things we do. And I'm getting to help create the design of like the UI design from the ground up, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, I just really like the collaborative nature of it and the fact that I still get to be creative while also coding. It's a great combination. Okay. Um, Ken kind of stole my answer, so I'll say the same thing in a slightly different way. <laughs> all right. Um, that's that's all good. Uh, the thing that I have always enjoyed most about this is really the sense of giving back, right? In the commercial world, often you're selling widgets, and there's a time and a place for all of that, and that's good. But um, I was actually going to use the fusion reactor <laughs> example as a way of, you know, this could be, when they get it figured out, a, a huge jump forward in humanity, right? It could change the way that we approach pretty much everything. And being able to be a part of something like that is something that, as corny as it sounds, like makes me excited when I get up in the morning, even if all I'm doing is just this one little piece of it, right? We're all just doing this one little piece of it, but together we're able to come together and, you know, change the face of the world. All right, perfect. Everyone, thank you so much for your answers. So, so um, I think that I have one last question. I mean, no, not one last question, but a second, 
a second last question before we move on to Jan's Q and A. Hey, so I know that networking is really exciting and all, but I know that it's also really challenging. So for everyone, and where are some challenges that you face specifically when you work at ESNet? So uh, I think that we could maybe try doing it in the opposite order. All right, good. I'll steal Ken's answer now. Um, so <laughs> the the hardest part, I think, for me specifically, it's it's a boon and it's a it's a curse at the same time. So ESNet, you may have inferred by listening to all of us talk, there's not a single one of us here on this panel who even live in the same state, right? <laughs> Um, and that's great. It has really allowed us to hire, you know, sort of the best and brightest minds. Uh, you're not constrained by geographic location. Um, but one of the things that people don't always necessarily think of is the human element, right? It's a little bit harder when you don't see each other face to face all the time, um, when you can't just go lean over somebody's, you know, uh, cubicle or go into their office or whatever and just chat for 30 seconds, right? The technology offers us a lot of flexibility, um, but we've got to be very mindful and very deliberate about maintaining a lot of those human elements as well. A good point, Dan. Um, uh, for me, I think coming fresh out of graduate school with only about three years of coding experience is just really getting ramped up. And I had a really, really fast um, learning curve at first and just trying to, to make my way and figure out what I'm doing half the time. Um, we're fortunately given a lot of independence in our work, but then that means we also have to be responsible with that independence and um, figure a lot of stuff out, which I actually really enjoy. So I guess it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. Um, although to Dan's point, I do miss being able to just like lean over to the person next to me and ask them a question. <laughs> now I just slack them incessantly. All right, slack them. <laughs> that was, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that slack. was clear, that slack. slack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say from the, the science engagement perspective um, and the team I work on, you know, we have so many facets of the, what we do from, uh, you know, the, looking at coding uh, to different applications, to the system, to the networking, to storage, and try to troubleshoot all the different parts of the ecosystem and the workflow. The human factor does come into it because some of it we we see people when we go to conferences, you know, that we when we can, and then other times we a lot of it's done over Zoom. So people get very busy, and it's very hard to kind of get things done like that. And when you're trying to talk to numerous people across multiple organizations that all have different workflows and all have different um, you know, things going on in projects, it's very difficult to you know challenging and get things done. Um, because a lot of times across the ESNet, you might be going from one university to another. So you need to talk to someone at the university, someone at their regional network, someone at the, the ESNet backbone, one of us, um, someone at the other regional network, someone at the other university. So there's a minimum of five people just to get on a phone call and try to coordinate things, let alone the people they need to get involved to get the work done, or even, even one another slayer out. So it's there's a lot of the the idea of like um, the, you know peeling an onion or something like that. Um, it's very difficult to kind of get um, things worked around, and at the same time, financial and sustainability models. A lot of times, equipment and purchase um, is around research and workflows is either set up as a an initial funding, uh, long term funding, or operational funding, and some of these things um, are planned out appropriately and some of them are not so you could be working on something and all of a sudden funding is like oh it's not there anymore sorry um because there wasn't enough planning around the funding so if you look at the research models you look at the research workflows but at the same time having the funding models built around that and constantly and to be in a continuous conversation as well moves the project along but also can, can sustain the effort of the science and the effect of the science so. Hens is a really like good, good intro to mine, um, because I think for me coming into this new world, it's my biggest challenge is sort of learning the ins and outs of an entirely different network and community. Um, so understanding like where a lab's funding comes from or a site's funding comes from and what motivates their work uh, mm -hmm. has been challenging for me because like we talked about in the commercial world, everybody has sort of a similar motivation, right? Like, and for me, it was connect me to the internet so I can sell something. Um, and that's pretty easy to understand. But uh, for this world, um, 
we're supporting a million different scientific in initiatives and innovations. And so understanding all the inner workings and all of the different people that you need to talk to at a particular site to move something forward um, is, is tricky and complicated. So I am still, that's why one year is nothing, I feel like in this industry to really understand um, how complicated uh, the, the, the connections between all of these places are. There, I get the connections mean there must be a lot of communication and a specific question from the audience asked about the different coding languages you might use. So for those who are maybe coding on a daily basis, what are the different coding languages that you're using? Did you have to learn different ones to communicate with uh, different people and was that difficult? So for anyone who's um, doing some coding, could you answer that question for us? Um, I can, sure. Um, I, I would actually throw out as a, as a, like a general lesson through my experience going through this, the actual coding languages are not as important as the coding concepts. Um, good, good database design, good data structure fundamentals, those apply pretty much universally. So to answer the actual question, however, yes, I have learned different coding languages over the years. But honestly, once you've established those fundamentals, picking up a new language, you know, it takes a little bit of time, especially the nuance, and there's always some details that are different. But it's not as hard as it is to learn what I would say, like your first programming languages, where you're still building all of those fundamentals. Oh, Dan, still my answer. The algorithms are more important than the languages themselves. Um, but to answer the question also, I use mostly JavaScript and TypeScript in my day-to-day. -day. Um, and that's because I'm doing front-end stuff. I know other people on our team use Python, Go, C. We use a lot of things. It's kind of mm -hmm. just whatever you, whoever started the project wrote it in a language and then you kind of just go with that. Um, but yeah, to Dan's point, it once you've got a couple of them under your belt and you figure out how they work and you really have a strong background in like the algorithms it takes and the pseudocode and the thought process to get there, I mean, there's documentation to help you fill in the rest. Yeah, and I would say even um, even though I'm not coding 100% anymore, um, I would say from there, looking at coding as an option, even if it's just an elective or you're filling a, another area in you know, college class, even if you're performing arts majors like, you know, you guys were, um, taking a coding class uh, takes you through a series of things that will take larger problems and break them down into smaller problems. So you can apply that across multiple things. It doesn't necessarily have to be coding, but you can actually break things down into like steps of getting something done, whether it's, you know, uh, repairing something, whether it's, you know, working through a project, whether it's like trying to find resources here and there to go through something. A lot of those fundamentals that are in coding can really be applied to multiple areas in your life. So you just take an intro to coding course, um, really, no matter what major you're in, I think it's going to, it's beneficial. Ah, absolutely beautiful. So, so um, why don't we take a step back from networking for a second, because looking through the the questions are audience submit, and I see some really interesting ones. But um, let's how about yeah. So for Katrina and Jessica, do you still do musical theater or, pro or performing arts as a hobby? So um, yes and no. I kind of still do it a little bit. Um, obviously, we kind of dropped off during COVID and grad school because um, that was just pretty grueling. And then I had two kids. So it's more so the children that make it harder um, to do, especially on stage stuff, just because the the time commitment is a lot more. But I still help out here and there. Um, I do some stage managing here and there. Some of my friends are directors, so I'll help them with their shows here and there. Yeah. Hopefully soon when the kids get older, I'll get back into it. Yeah, so actually very similar for me. <laughs> um, I there, there's lots of cool opportunities in New York to do like um, like short term stuff. So there's like you know there's a, um, a community called Shot who will put together you know essentially in a in a month long time frame they will write 
um, rehearse and perform a small plays. Uh, so stuff like that is a great way, like I get to keep my hand in, but that has not happened so much recently because I just had a baby. <laughs> um, so I've also sort of been in and and they didn't have a lot of roles for pregnant ladies. So um, haven't done that much uh, recently, um, but as much as I can, yeah, doing a little creative something or just a quick weekend performance or something uh, is you know, good for the soul. Awesome, thanks. Uh, we always encourage being well-rounded. I'm actually gonna pass it back to Gregory for our next question out of the chat box. All right, let's see what the audience is asking. Ah, here's a good one. All right, so oh, how common is it for programmers to get into research fields if there seem to be many more private sector jobs? I guess another way of putting it is, will it make someone work for ESnet over like uh, over like a regular tech company, like for example, Google or all the other big tech companies? Sure, I can I can take a stab at that. Um, I think you heard from many of us that there's sort of a belief in the mission, right? I think that's something that you'll hear echoed from a lot of people who work at ESNet. So there's a bit of a selection bias here, a self-selection bias, and that you're getting people who are already interested in this sort of thing, right? I don't think I'm I am not a physicist. I have no idea how fusion works, <laughs> but I appreciate it, right? As a concept and as what it, uh, what I think that it can do to better humanity. Um, there's also one other element that if if you know the soft feels don't do it for you, there's one other element that I would throw out. Um, which is that the this field or this area tends to be a lot more stable. Um, you know, you you hear or if you've been paying attention at all to things that have happened in, say, oh, Twitter in the last six months. Right. It's been very chaotic there. Lots of people just very suddenly lost their jobs um, or, you know, things take 90 degree turns and you might not be on board with that. Um, that that sort of thing doesn't tend to happen as as much or as frequently over here. So for people who you know really like stability, this could be um, a good choice as well. Oh wow! Now you're making me want to work at ESNet. Anyone else have anything to add to this? No. All right, and so Faye, you think they can ask the next question? Yeah, I think given the time, we're gonna get into our final question. So Gregory, I think you have that for us. Ah, all right. And so for everyone, uh, in less than a minute, it tell me, if you could talk to yourself, you were like 17 or 18, and uh, what advice would you give to yourself? I think we're gonna go Ken, Jesse, Dan, and then Katrina. <laughs> Uh, I would say, um, find something you enjoy, um, and try it. Don't be afraid to fail, fail fast. I mean, I switched my major to almost three times. I mean, I, I went, went to school for one thing, but I actually signed up for something different there and kind of get through it. Um, and like I said, your, your life's going to change your, your, what you're interested in, you know, what potentially change. So don't be so stuck on really where you're going because, you know, um, like a lot of our stories, things change, you know, and you need to be adaptable and be able to take those on and, you know, just understand that, you know, you're just keep working for what you're working for and, you know, um, try to keep focused on that. And then the second thing I'd be is um, understanding like financial and, and sustainability, things like that. You know, I mentioned that in projects, but even in your own world, just making sure you have your finances together and things like that. And it's a lot of things now, um, the side, I, I do financial coaching on the side, you know, and it's just amazing. You know, so what, how financial stress really can affect people and the work they're doing. So um, it's very beneficial to kind of like have that taken care of as well. So you're going to have different stuff on your careers, but also, you know, uh, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, that's such good advice. My, I, I agree with definitely both, but the mine is similar to the, the first part of Ken's. Like, you're not just one thing. You're not your degree or your job. You can have varied interests, and you can put those capabilities to work in different fields. Um, and I think you'd probably be really surprised how much an outsider perspective um, is useful at whatever job you're in. Um, so 
you know, bring those capabilities from one industry into another. Uh, and that makes you a really valuable hire um, because yeah, you're not just this one thing. You haven't had a narrow scope. You've been exposed to all sorts of different interesting worlds uh, and you can bring that experience to the job and, and make yourself, you know, a really special person within any industry. I think I'm next. If I were going back in time to my eight year, 18 year old self, I would tell me to buy Apple stock. But yeah, outside of that, um, I in school, I was uh, very much like straight A's memorization, very much by the books kind of person. And in some ways, I felt like that made me struggle a little bit adapting to the real world, right? A lot of problems, there's not an immediate black and white answer to things, right? Um, so what I would say is, you know, focus less on focus less on, you know, the, the right memorization, you know, the, the exact day that this event happened on, that doesn't matter. I can Google that. That's easy, right? The, the real important thing is, is what mattered about it, right? Le focus about learning about learning. <laughs> Don't focus on memorization. Dan and I are older children, if you couldn't tell. Um, no, so kind of echoing what everyone else said about just you know, trusting that you'll get to where you need to be eventually. I would say it, know your worth, which is super cliche, but super true. Like you have a lot to bring to the table um, with your individual skill sets. Funnily enough, to Jesse's point, I got my research assistant position in grad school with less than a year of coding under my belt because of my soft skills. Everyone else in the grad program was way better at coding than me. I just started, but like my boss there literally told me, we hired you because of your soft skills and your ability to deal with other people. Um, and that ended up landing me this job here. So just, you know, be well-rounded, trust in yourself. And if you're not a morning person, do not sign up for 7.30 math classes. It's not a good idea. It's not going to work. And that's all. Well, first of all, that was a great answer. I would like to thank you all for joining us this webinar and, you know, for joining us to the last webinar for this summer. You can find all the recordings of our previous career talks on our website, and the link will be posting as we're speaking. Once again, thank you all. Have a great weekend, and it was an honor to be with all of you. Thank you. Yeah.